guys, so this video is going to be discussing pages 199 through 224. And these pages start very interestingly because at the end of page 198, we find out that Dick and Perry are thought to be in Kansas City. But on page 199, we find Dick and Perry in Florida. And this is one of the decisions that Capote makes, which is kind of an interesting one, which is to jump ahead a little bit in the action. And sometimes when we're jumping back and forth between the Dick and Perry side of the story and the clutter side or the investigator side, Capote makes these choices. And if you were reading carefully and you realize they were in Florida and you're like, wait a minute, weren't they just in Kansas City? I hope that we're still a little bit not on the side of the killers and that you were disappointed for Dewey because finding out that they had blown the coop, that they had gotten past him and realizing that at the beginning of the reading is something that I always find very sad for Dewey. You know, he really thought he was going to catch them and yet they escaped to Florida. And um, Meredith Meters, who's in, I think, my third bell class, if I'm remembering correctly, brought to my attention a really interesting thing at the beginning of the semester, which is that um, there was a case in Florida, and it's discussed at length in your book, at, both in these pages and in pages 251 through 271, there was another family killed in very much the same style as the Clutters, same size of family, and it happened in Tallahassee, Florida at the same time that Dick and Perry were in Tallahassee, Florida. In fact, Capote puts them in Florida reading a news story about it, and Perry says something like, gosh, this must have been someone who was inspired by what we did. But investigators now think, now, in 2013, that Dick and Perry may have been the killers of that family, given that it was similar to the clutters that they were in the same area when it happened. And we'll discuss this more in the video for pages 257 through 271. Um, but I think it's very plausible that they did commit that murder. And again, the whole idea of Dewey wanting to catch Dick and Perry before they did something else, I think this really shows that he was right, that they were dangerous that it was worthwhile to catch them because if they were the ones that committed that murder in Florida, if Dewey had caught them in Kansas City when he thought he was going to, that never would have happened. In these chapters, we start to delve a little bit more into Dick's mindset. And I have to say, it's pretty disturbing. All of the things that Capote shares with us are things that put Dick in an even worse light and really just make him seem like a horrible person. There's a whole passage about how there's a nice resort near where Dick and Perry are staying, and they go there to hang out and have fun and schmooze with people, and Dick is bitter and upset and angry the whole time because when he sees successful people, it makes him feel like less of a man, and it makes him feel angry and small. And I think that we can see that that's the exact type of person who would go and kill other people, a jealous person who felt like they had something that he wanted, that he should be able to take it just because he wanted it. Um, and then we have this incident where at the not nice place where Dick and Perry are staying, there's this 12 year old girl on the beach and Dick tries to seduce her. Thankfully, it's a short scene. It's not very in depth, but Capote does reveal that, you know, in the interviews that he had done with Dick, that Dick is a pedophile, that Dick has several times in the past few years um, actually slept with children. And it's, it, that's the kind of thing that really you know, we can almost look at him as a murderer and say, okay, but is there a reason for it? But I think that for most of us, a sexual perversion like pedophilia is something that we look at and we say, there's no excuse for this. There's no reason for this. This is unacceptable. And Perry actually feels that way. Perry sees Dick hitting on this girl and judges him very harshly for it and really looks down on him for it, as we do. And I think at this point, Capote is starting to show a lot of us and what we would think in Perry. And it makes Perry seem even more human, even less dangerous, and even more like someone that we want to be sympathetic of. Um, and so then we flash back to um, Garden City and to what's been happening in Holcomb since, um, you know, it's been months since the killing and people are still dealing with it. And we see a little bit of Bobby here, Nancy's boyfriend. It, it's, it's pretty sad. You know, you can read it with however much emotion you want to, but hearing about how he can't eat and how he accidentally goes on runs to her house and visits with her horse. It's devastating. It's a very sad thing to think about. He's not much older than you guys, and he's dealing with this horrible thing that has happened to his girlfriend. Um, and there's this whole passage, which again, you know, Capote's really interested in poetry and the poetic, where Bobby talks about how uh, the Arkansas River was one of Nancy's favorite places and how the Arkansas River actually reminds him of her because it's very young and wild and free and untamed. And it's this really beautiful tribute to who Nancy was, but when you read it and then you realize that she's dead, it's a pretty disappointing thing to think about. It's very hard to see Bobby in those circumstances. 
Uh, Bobby also tells the story about uh, Mr. Clutter, and I think it's interesting, you know, Capote is still telling the human story of the Clutters even months after they've died. And in this story, um, Mr. Clutter's whole family used to go into town together and buy all their Christmas presents all at once. And they get snowed in and they can't make it into town. And so the young Mr. Clutter, little Herb, decides that he's going to go into town and buy all the presents for everyone. So he takes the horse and he goes out. And on his way home, his lantern breaks and he can't see anything and he almost dies. And it's a very dramatic story. It reminds me of something you'd see in an episode of Little House on the Prairie or something. And when he gets home, which he almost doesn't make it home and he almost dies, all the lights are off and he thinks that everyone went to bed and didn't care where he was. And they make fun of him and they're like, we didn't think that you were going to come home tonight. You know, you're crazy. Why didn't you stay in town? And again, I think Capote just tells us these stories to humanize the clutters, to make us feel even sadder about their death, and also to show us what kind of people they were. You know, the more and more that we read about them, it really does seem reasonable, like it says in the book, that everybody loved them, that they were just this lovable, wonderful family. Um, so then we flash back to Dick and Perry, and they're driving around the state of Florida heading to Texas. They can't stay in one place, and Dick is still really insistent on going to Kansas City, even though Perry still continues to think that it's a terrible idea to be in that area. They already got by once. It's like, why would we go back? And they pick up two hitchhikers, um, a little boy and an old man who's really sick. He seems to not hear things or be able to say things. And Dick wants to drop them off at the side of the road because he's afraid that the old man is going to die. But Perry doesn't approve of that plan, again, showing his humanity and his care for other people. Um, but they do decide to keep them in because Perry causes such a fuss about it and Dick doesn't want to, you know, have a fight with him. And they end up collecting bottles all along the side of the road. And it's this very sweet, kind of cute little story. Um, Perry gets really sucked into the fun of it. Even Dick gets involved in it. And again, you know, Capote takes these moments to humanize them to us. And yet, just a few moments ago, Dick wanted to shove these guys out into the cold and say, forget you, hopefully you don't die, but I don't really care. And it's this interesting kind of back and forth. And I think that one of the questions that Capote really wants us to ask is, how human is someone who can kill like this? Are they the kind of person that's all evil all the time? We could see them coming. They have some kind of mark on them that we can tell that they're evil, that something bad is going to happen when they're around. Or, and I think this is what he's trying to show us, are they people that mix in with you and I, people that maybe look a little strange, but don't really set off any alarm bells and do just as many normal things as you and I do when they're not out, you know, murdering and doing all sorts of other bad things. Um, and that's a scary thought. It's a much safer thought and a better thought to think that people like that would stand out and that we would know them and see them and avoid them. But I think that Capote shows us that you're not all evil when you, even when you are an evil person who does evil things. So in this chapter, if you're on the side of the investigators, which even I go back and forth sometimes, but right now I'm on the side of the investigators, um, they get a call that they know where Dick and Perry are again and that they've actually been arrested in Las Vegas. Now, this is kind of weird in terms of storytelling because the last time that we saw Dick and Perry, they were driving around in Texas. And so Capote is jumping around in the story again. But how many pages are we really supposed to read of Dick and Perry driving around in the middle of nowhere and hitchhiking? I think Capote at this point wants to move the story along a little bit. So he sends them out to Las Vegas to get them arrested so that we can move on with the story as well. Um, but when we get to Las Vegas, it's like we've time traveled back in time and Dick and Perry haven't been arrested yet. And what we find out is that Dick, and he's talked about this before, has decided to impersonate an Air Force officer and to try to pass a bunch of bad checks again. And he also plans on ditching Perry. He wants to get rid of Perry. He's tired of Perry. He starts talking about how he wish he would have killed Perry. And we realize again that Perry cares much more about Dick than Dick cares about Perry. And that's the story from the beginning. That's not something that I think should surprise anyone. But again, it does show us Dick's true character, that he's planning to ditch Perry in this moment when they don't seem to be making very good decisions. Um, and then they get arrested with a box full of their stuff, including the shoes that they wore on the night of the murder. It was really bad timing for them. Um, and Dick tells this very elaborate story about how he and Perry really did try to go to Fort Smith 
to meet up with Perry's sister to get the money, which is a story that they told to his family. This is a story we've heard before. And he gives all these additional details about how they slept with these women and stayed in this hotel and ate all this food. And we know that it's false. We know where they were. We've heard the story of what they were doing. But he has names for people and places, and it's a very, very elaborate story. And it almost starts to sound true. Keep in mind that they haven't seen the boots in the box yet, and they don't know that they have all this physical evidence yet. And they've kind of gone back and forth, they, the investigators, on wondering whether Dick and Perry really were the ones to commit the murders. And so if I were an investigator, I mean, I'm a teacher, so I tend to think the best of people. But if I were an investigator, I think I'd start to be worrying at this point of, you know, this is a really good story. Are these guys really the ones that we're looking for? But then, and again, the storytelling is just so delicious here and just so enjoyable here. And yes, I'm an English teacher. I call storytelling delicious because that's what we do. Um, Capote reveals to us that in the story, when uh, Dick and Perry had gotten to Fort Scott, Dick said that they had gone and checked into the post office and found out that Perry's sister wasn't there anymore. And that's when they went off and started, you know, sleeping with these girls and eating all this food and staying in this motel. But the investigators happened to know that the post office in Fort Scott, where they were supposed to have checked in for Perry's sister, is closed on Saturdays. And it is the first hint that we get that Dick and Perry's luck has changed. The investigators have the upper hand, and they have finally captured the men who have done this evil thing. And I think it's kind of natural in this moment to think, forget Perry and his awful childhood. Yes, we're getting some justice. And I think it's kind of an exciting moment of the story up to this point. Um, so you guys have been asking, uh, since I've wrapped up my discussion, for some kind of a hint or a trick or some kind of a special prize for watching the videos. So um, this is Demetrius. He is a Frankenstein statue that one of my students made for me a couple of years ago. And sometime soon on a quiz, I'm going to ask, what is the name of Miss Van Mill's Frankenstein figurine? And you can tell me. Demetrius, and I don't really care how you spell it as long as it sounds like Demetrius and looks like Demetrius, and he sits on my bookshelf, so if you ever get a chance to come say hi to him, he is back here. He's pretty precious to me, so I don't want you to touch him, but this is Demetrius, so that is a little hint for you on a quiz for the future, and Demetrius and I are signing off now because parent-teacher conferences are almost finally over, and I will post some more videos from home tonight if I have the energy, which I'm not sure if I will.